Thank you so much. And it's been a fascinating morning. It's hard to, to have a very, very impactful session after the last one that we heard, but we'll try and do our best. Um, I'm just honored to host two very distinguished leaders here. Uh, you know, while uh, Justin talked about their qualifications and what they do, I think if you know Ram, and I think most people know Ram, he's the person who really believes in building an ecosystem of giving back and sharing and learning. So, uh, Ram, thank you so much for always making the time for NASCOM. Thank you, Sanita. And uh, Geeta, I was, uh, I'm interacting with her for the first time, but I was so impressed with her, her passion on, uh, you know, digital transformation, climate change. She was, uh, you know, a woman in... Uh, uh, you know, amongst the winner of the Women in Hydrogen 50. And that is like really something, Geeta. So thank you so much again for joining us today. My uh, pleasure. Thank you. So I, I want to start with, uh, you know, uh, your personal journeys. There's been so much talk about this whole future of work, what it means for, for the organization, for our employees. But what does it mean for you as a leader? What is the change that you have personally done being a leader in all this change that's around us? And, and you know, help us understand that. So maybe, Ram, if we can start with you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Sangeeta. And thanks for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Chennai because I'm, uh, even though I live, I live in Bangalore now, but born and brought up in Chennai. So it's a special place in my heart. Um, I think, you know, I've been working for 36 years. The 32 years of that was more traditional, right? We went to office every day, got up in the morning, five days a week. We took for granted that the people we work with will always be there, unless, of course, they were out for a day or two because of vacation. So the traditional work was, was how we were all trained to work. Of course, pandemic changed all that, and uh, suddenly we were all found ourselves you know, looking at a rectangular screen for most part and trying to engage with people. And uh, post-pandemic, it was always surprising how different people looked when they got off the screen and you got to see them again, you know, over time. And of course, during the four years or two years of pandemic, people just suddenly looked different. You know, maybe it was just we got trained to looking at them differently. So which also meant that, uh, you know, for somebody who's, you know, more used to a more traditional work atmosphere, you had to make the change. You know, I, I learned fairly early in my career that uh, culture, you have to adapt to cultures and the cultures don't adapt to you. So even if you thought that everybody should be back in office and, you know, you should be present all the time, the world had changed. So as a leader, you had to start to adopt and adapt to what was the reality around you rather than worrying about, you know, how you should look at reality the way you thought it should look. So I think as a, as, you know, personally I've got adapted to this point of, you know, how do I have to adapt myself to engage with people, you know, uh, who are now going to look, who look at work very differently today. So I think at a personal level that has been the biggest change and adaptation that I can think of, you know, uh, now that things are, you know, are no longer under the pandemic kind of a scenario. I, I think I fully resonate with that. I think pre-pandemic I was very poor with remote working. Uh, and remote teams, I think I've learned a lot better on how to, to be much more fairer in those discussions. Geeta, what about you? First of all, uh, I'd like to thank NASCOM, Sangeeta and the team for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this panel with distinguished people like Ram and yourself, Sangeeta, and wonderful to see that uh, you have really embraced uh, diversity and inclusion uh, by having uh, you know, our colleague here. Um, I would say that for me, the biggest learning has been to really embrace a growth mindset. Um, and of course, this started a little pre-pandemic, but the pandemic aggravated that or accelerated that thinking. Um, where most of us were working virtually, there was also an opportunity to learn new things, new topics and pick up new skills by using online learning. Um, whilst, you know, we were all connected virtually and there was a bit of disconnect in terms of physical, you know, kind of closeness or hanging out together, the advantage that the pandemic, uh, you know, scenario gave us was to be able to learn, pick up new skills and not limit our knowledge or thinking. Because um, for many of you, I don't know whether you're familiar with growth mindset and fixed mindset, but I think growth mindset essentially believes that your capability, your potential is not limited by your initial qualification and initial years of experience, which means you can keep learning continuously and, you know, becoming better as a, as a professional and also as a person. That has been, to be honest, one of the most you know, important kind of learnings for me, Sangeeta. That's phenomenal, I think, to, to continuously invest in yourself is, is really what, what this world is about. Um, 
I think, you know, we've heard in the last, since the morning, we've been hearing about all the changes. Uh, Pramit talked about geopolitics and technology. Anu talked about all the labor market shifts that are taking place. Um, I think the AI conversation, you continue to have it. You cannot have a conversation without the word AI coming up. Uh, so in this world of exponential change, so it's not just change, it's exponential change. How do you think leaders should be navigating this shift, right? Do I stop what I'm doing, what is maybe mission critical, and say, or oh, put all my energy on AI, or how do I balance the priorities of today with what is important for tomorrow? So maybe, Geeta, if you want to start with that, you live in a world which is so much more prone to change right now. Absolutely. Very pertinent question, uh, Sangeeta. So if you um, really look at you know, how organizations are now grappling with change, one of the key things that we are realizing is this multi-generational working. Um, you have people, which was earlier touched upon in some ways, but you have people with 30, 35 years, 40 years of experience in some cases. There are people who have just graduated and are entering the workforce, and there are some people somewhere in the middle. And it's really understanding what drives each group of people, you know, in different sort of generational segments. And a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to work. So for leaders, we've got to be really cognizant and conscious of how we understand what the needs are for each of these, you know, segment of employees. That's why when we talk about employee value proposition, what was really very important for, you know, maybe uh, employees maybe 25, 30 years back is not necessarily what it is today. And it's not only about, you know, compensation and career growth. It's about being, uh, you know, uh, welcomed into an organization to an office space where, you know, you have opportunity to collaborate. There are, you know, sort of collab areas. There's some opportunity for you to relax. Maybe you have a ta table tennis corner. You, fro you provide, you know, a cafeteria with some refreshments. Because people, especially I'm mean, talking from an Indian context, are supporting organizations uh, or offices across the globe and in different time zones. So many of them are working odd hours, some of them are working extended hours. But they're all doing work with a lot of passion. So what can we do to help them to work in an environment that motivates them and inspires them? So that's one thing. And the second thing is, I feel personally, um, the next thing that leaders have to realize is about not just celebrating successes, but also encouraging an environment where we do not penalize failures. Because when we talk about you know, fails, fa fail fast approach and experimentation, these are not some things naturally you know, teams tend to do. They are always scared of taking something new, coming out of their comfort zone. But growth and learning can happen only if people attempt, you know, experiment. And some may succeed, some may not succeed in the first attempt, but we have to build that culture. I genuinely feel that as leaders, we need to do more of that to encourage people to make mistakes and yet, you know, give them all the support they need to keep moving on. No, I think those are very important ingredients, Ram. Yeah, sure. I think one of the things that I've found, I mean, this is even pre-pandemic and it probably got accentuated post or during pandemic and post, is how do you bring a very strong sense of purpose in the organization? Now, every organization has got a set of strategies, especially if you're a global company, you know, you, you kind of paint the strategy in the context of your customers, your other stakeholders. But then how do you make people understand what is their role in that context? And I think one of the things I found, even in the current scenario, it starts to work well is, how do you help people explain the purpose of, their organize, of the work that they do? And how does it connect back into a success for not just the organization, but for the customers as well? Right? I think that's the first step of connecting a very strong purpose down to the people in terms of what they do. Otherwise, it's just a job. Right? I mean, it is, you know, you could be doing anything at that point. It's just look at it as a paycheck that comes based on a job that you do or a gig work that you do, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, it's been documented. I mean, there are case studies on this which goes back in various domains that talk about building a sense of purpose makes a huge difference. I mean, there was a, there's a very popular old case study on New York General Hospital which talks about the fact that the death rate was so high in the ICUs of people who caught secondary infections that, you know, the, the, the head of the hospital made it a purpose right down to the janitors who cleaned the hospital to say, your job is to reduce the death rate. And that actually affected, they changed the dynamics of how the hospital operated. So things like that are, you know, are, are uh, educative when we think about organizations. So to me, I think building that purpose is very, very important. Second is engagement. A lot of people do their day job, and many of them do very well, right? I mean, there's a whole performance review process that happens, which is a standard part of any company. What is less measurable 
is how do you open up horizontal avenues? You know, Sangeeta talked about building ecosystems. How are you building an ecosystem, communities of practice within an organization that helps people connect their passion and learnings and experience to the work that they can bring horizontally through an organization? So I'll give you an example, right? One of the things, you know, I, I normally look at four dimensions in any, you know, the organizations that I manage, one of which is innovation. So traditionally, innovation is thought about as a ballywack of you know, your engineering or your technology teams. That's where innovation happens. But I would argue innovation happens everywhere. In my previous company, one of the things, we were building out some new, new offices in India. And the real estate team came to me and said, look, we would like to use IoT in our new office. So we said, OK, sure, why not? Let's go experiment. But I said, on one condition, you design and implement it. The engineering or IT and all of us will support you, but you will drive it, right, from concept through execution. And that, I think, was the biggest game changer that we saw, that the real estate team actually went out, found the right vendors, implemented it so that we could manage all our offices across India from a, ne from a real estate operation center, not a network operation center that you would think about. And they were most proud about it. And they were showing it to everybody who came to our office. The thing is, the, the, that kind of a horizontal engagement and providing avenues for people to engage, which is beyond their day job, I have found is a game changer in terms of driving enga engagement across the organization. This has nothing to do with hybrid workforce. It has nothing to do with in the office. It is really a mindset shift where people start believing that they can do something which is beyond their day job and make an effective job out of it. And like Geeta rightly pointed out, this is not about success or failure. It's about doing things, trying it out, fail fast, right, and move on to the next thing, but create the avenues for it within an organization. I think these two will be the things yeah. that I talk about. So I think it, it really goes back to the facts that you said, right? Create the right environment, give the right opportunities, create the right engagement, and allow them to fail, success, prosper. I, I think if we create that environment, any change can be navigated, and it will be different for obviously different organizations. Uh, you know, one of the other things that we as NASCOM often see is that as an industry, more, more specifically the technology services industry, all the growth was always linear in terms of you know, bigger teams, as an individual I'm growing, if my team size is growing. And in this new world of technology, it's a lot about core technology skills that are becoming relevant. While most of the organizations were structured as leaders grew, they became more about people management roles. How do we reshape that where being a core technology expert is actually even more relevant than being a real, only a large people manager. And I know, Ram, I'll start with you because this is a topic you've been very passionate about. <laughs> Thanks, Sangeeta. How many of you here use AI on a day-to-day -day basis? How many of you use Google search? All of us. <laughs> You're using AI on a daily basis. You've been using machine learning and AI for, you know, ever since Google, Google originated. The point I wanted to make was, it comes down to, you know, you don't have to know how to build a large language model and, uh, you know, train one. I don't know how to do it. I mean, I've never tried it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be using technology. It's, how many of you drive a car here? How many of you drive a car? Or a two-wheeler or whatever, right? Do you know how to actually make one? Design one? No, right? Most of us don't. So, but that doesn't stop you from using it for effectively for transportation. I think technology is like that, right? I think there's going to be, there's going to be a small group of people who will create it. There's going to be a massive group of people who will use it on a daily basis. And that's one, angle, one dimension to this, right? So I think I would suggest that, you know, fighting technology is a, is a losing battle because at some point it's going to overwhelm you or you'll start using it without even knowing it exists, right, to a large extent. So I think this whole debate of will AI take away jobs or not take away jobs, I think is, is a, you know, it's an interesting debate. I think it keeps a lot of events running. It leaves a lot of WhatsApp and social media going. But I'm not sure how useful it is in the wrong run. The biggest, uh, the, the only other point I make is the, the biggest, uh, you know, education that you can get is by looking at history. So I was, I was, when we were chatting before the panel, I was saying I'm reading the Ken Follett's Kingsbridge series. I don't know if you've read Ken Follett. I don't know how many of you read fiction, but, um, you know, I love reading fiction, to be honest. I, love this. I find it less boring than reading very heavy technical or, or business books. I do read those, but, uh, but this one talks about this particular saga era is around 
the mills were shifting from manual labor to mechanization. And the Luddite movement, how many of you heard of the Luddite movement that happened in Europe? They're back there, one hand. The Luddites were basically anti-technology and they went around breaking mills that were using, you know, steam engine driven mills, etc., etc. right? Now think about it. Over time, that got encapsulated. People just adopted it, started using it. The workforce adjusted. Yes, there is short-term pain. I'm not saying there isn't. But there is, right? The other thing, the last thing on technology is, my experience has always been, technology is always overrated in the short run and underrated in the long run. You know, I, I was fortunate enough, or maybe I'm old enough to have lived through several shifts in technology from a, you know, from a, techno from a internet perspective, right? In the mid-90s, um, the internet was going to do everything that we still haven't fully, you know, developed, right? At that time, it was the fridge was going to order your groceries automatically. I'm not kidding. I mean, 94, 95, these were the use cases being discussed. I mean, how many of our fridges are actually ordering groceries automatically now, right? So the thing is, all I'm trying to say is, you know, sometimes we overestimate what the technology is going to do, but also underestimate. So technology will take over our lives over time, right? It doesn't mean that it won't do it, and we'll all adjust to it. Next generations will adjust to it and keep going. But the underpinning of all of this is get used to it. The faster you can adopt it, start using it, you know, for, for, for what it works for you, and then adopt it and move on, right? So, Kita, maybe if I can ask you that question on what are the key skills that will enable a professional or an HR leader to be successful at least for the next few years? We know these skills will continue to change. But what do you think will be some which will be foundational, but some we should invest today in to make sure we can stay ahead at least? Sure, that was a brilliant, uh, you know, sort of uh, narrative you shared, Ram, about technology. I mean, it's it's so true that, uh, you know, it, some people overestimate uh, how much change it will bring. But, uh, yeah, it does happen over time. So, Sangeeta, coming to your point, I think, uh, you know, we've seen in the past how, you know, with multiple shifts happening across the world, across geopolitical, you know, situations, some changes are forced upon us, which we can't, you know, avoid. But some changes are, uh, you know, some things that we can work towards, we can sort of plan, like, you know, alluding to what was spoken earlier in the day. So I think from um, HR leaders' perspective or people who are looking at talent development, um, uh, I think we have to really look at not just technical skills, which are a given in any uh, case, but also look at softer attributes, like, you know, how do we develop critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, and to, in a way, it's a bit of a contradiction to say that, you know, if you use chat GPT and you want to, you know, create a presentation, you can easily get some points on something, whatever it may be, transformation, digital transformation, or whatever it is, it'll give you points. But the point is that, uh, you use technology to enhance your understanding, enhance your skills, but not as a substitute. I mean, because then that will not take you anywhere. So realizing some attributes and skills are going to be non-negotiable, which is problem solving, being able to interpret the data that you get by using technology, being able to also um, be responsible about how you use AI and you know similar cognitive technologies, because it is going to give you the results based on the data that it's trained on, you know, and that data, if it's biased, for example, if somebody were to ask, you know, give me an image of a CEO of a large industrial manufacturing company, is it going to give a lady or a, or a ma male, you know, I mean, I don't know, I mean, just saying. So it's also about the kind of data you're going to train it on. So it's about being conscious to remove any biases, you know, in the type of um, culture that we build in organizations because the people that run it, the people that generate the data will then not carry that bias. And that's the data that your model will be trained on. So there are some fundamental things, critical thinking, problem solving. And earlier there was a comment about resilience. I think in a way we see resilience as the ability to tide over any setbacks and you know any unplanned events, for example. Uh, you know, I think the ability to really adapt is going to be important because then you will not think that, you know, technology has overtaken you and you're, you know, struggling to find your way. It's the ability to quickly change course and then accept the change and move on. So for us, the soft skills are going to be also extremely important as we deal with the technological shifts and the changes that are going on. And it starts from, you know, uh, school, I would say. We are currently, you know, kind of having education system that teaches kids lot of subjects and with a lot of focus on STEM, no doubt, which is great. But for the next 15, 20 years, is it going to be the same? No. We've seen things changing in the last few years itself. So 
how do we naturally you know include focus around problem solving and creativity and you know things around uh, maybe reasoning so judging and being able to take decisions somehow we need to bring that in rather than just looking at you know ability to crunch problems or you know numbers i think fundamentally that has to change and culturally i think people have to also embrace uh, different you know careers because what will happen is otherwise um, people's you know opportunity to grow and evolve becomes narrowed down to certain subjects or certain you know sectors only so i think if we have to build a workforce for the future certain skills are absolutely essential and these are more towards i guess softer skills and uh, you know ability to change adapt learn learnability is key um, and uh, the technical skills will always be there they are going to be still important yeah that's my take sangeeta no, i think fully agree and i think those are much more hard, harder to do just at an institutional level it requires a lot of the individuals or efforts to make these real I know we'll have time for one or two questions. If there are any hands, please, uh, can we go? Can we get some mics here? I'm Dr. Damodaran from Ampara Technologies. Our company focuses on primarily offering employment for people with disabilities, right? Even though in India there are seven crore people today with disabilities, typically still they are seen more in the workforce or non-skilled workforce, right? One of the challenges, uh, if you really see, when companies go to tier two and tier three cities, train students, engineering students, and hire them, it's seen as a business case, right? Whereas the same is being done for a person with disability, a student with disability, it's seen as a CSR activity. How can it change when we talk about future workforce, inclusive workforce for people with disability? Because engineering colleges reached out in Tamil Nadu alone, all the 500 engineering colleges through our universities help, and uh, they didn't have the database. Uh, finally, who graduated in 2024, we got totally eight students who had disabilities, but it's a lot more. We are hoping in 2025 it will be, we'll be able to gather the database better. But that's one challenge. How do you think companies can help in addressing that and treat it more as a business rather than as a CSR activity? Yeah. Uh, and maybe I can start on that because uh, it's an area that is close to my heart as well. Um, I, I think there are two aspects to this. There is one piece of this which is more fundamental skill building that needs to happen at an early age even for people with disabilities. And I think the reach for us happens to be through CSR for those kinds of activities because, you know, for us to access that age group, it becomes difficult if we are trying to do it directly. But you bring up a good point is, how do you make this business as usual rather than treat it as a special case of activities that we do? So one of the things that we have tried in my previous job as well as this one is to create internal groups of people who are focused on this, you know, on this cohort of people and how do we address it, not through CSR but really with engagement through our balance sheet, right? Whether it is engagement with organizations that are working with people with disabilities and bring in some of the skill sets that, that, that can be utilized there. One of the, I think, potentially undiscovered yet uh, use cases for things like AI is to help with people with disabilities. Because at that point, you know, it is not a traditional mouse keyboard game, right? There are other ways of engaging through media to actually use these tools as a more effective medium for inclusivity. I think that is not being talked about enough. I mean, I, I, I will take it on as a, as a potential, you know, as an industry person who should probably driving that dialogue. And maybe I'll take that up with the, you know, with the, the other aspects of NASCOM to see how do we actually use that use case under Sangeeta that's already being thought about yeah, from not, AI. Not that much. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. But I think AI use cases as an inclusivity mechanism for people with disabilities, I think could be a very good, strong use case for a country like India and definitely worth thinking about. Thank you. Uh, great uh, points shared by you, Ram. Um, I, I do agree we have not done enough as uh, an industry or, you know, as a corporate uh, sector itself. Um, primarily, it's, it has started off by, you know, as um, a focus for a business which is more responsible, you know, and more inclusive. I agree with you. But uh, there's a lot of untapped talent that is sitting there. Uh, and I think somewhere, um, you know, the government as well as 
corporate, large corporates need to consciously create forums or you know sort of uh, you know ecosystem where these opportunities are discussed. The skills that are you know available with such people should be brought out into the open, discussed, and look at which are the industries that can benefit from them. It's not about industries or companies doing a you know kind of going out of way and doing a CSR. It's not that. How can you actually tap into the talent which is today missing from you know the workforce? So I think this needs focused efforts, um, and like uh, Ram mentioned, uh, I think there's a responsibility on some of us who are uh, perhaps connected at multiple levels to create that sort of momentum and bring more visibility for such, uh, you know, sort of groups, and uh, be able to track and measure the progress because. You know, doing some events, talking about it, or writing articles is one thing. But really being able to, in, you know, include that workforce into the workforce, include that segment into the workforce, and be able to, um, you know, give them the opportunity to feel included in an in a you know in an office environment is important. Sometimes there's also the sensitization, right, with people uh, who are not necessarily having such different abilities, for them to be empathetic and understand what it takes to have a team member who has something, you know, which is not necessarily uh, seen as normal or, uh, you know, different. So I think uh, this has to be addressed at multiple levels. I, I think so far we may have just paid lip service in my view, talking from my perspective as well. So yes, I definitely think there's opportunity for us to do more on that. We quickly have the next question. I know we our time's up. Good morning, ma'am. This is uh, Dr. Jay Sudha Subaraj, uh, Dean Placement from Sri Krishna Institutions, ma'am. Uh, I have two questions. One is like, uh, what is that you are expecting as a placement uh, dean? I'm uh, more interested to know, like, what is that you are expecting from the young workforce? Because you already, Gita, ma'am, already listed uh, certain things, and if you could give us uh, five important things you are expecting from the young uh, workforce, that is one thing, ma'am. And the second question is like, what are the different ways you are appreciating the young forces to be uh, 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 to stay in the organization apart from the perks and salaries? What are the different things you are doing in the organizations, ma'am? This is the two things. Thank you. Okay. If I understood your question right, you are asking about the what is what is our expectation from industry for the graduating classes of the future, okay? And the second question was more about when we hire them, what are we doing with to, to get them skilled? Is that… Exactly. Is that, is that the thing, the exactly. question here? Okay. On the first part, and I'll and I'm certainly have Geeta had her point of view on this. Um, first of all, I think, you know, one of the things that we expect that, you know, student to be is um, learning, learnability, you know. No, no educational institution can prepare 100 percent somebody who's coming in for the job because every company is different, every process is different, you know, our industry is different. So what we, first of all, I think, you know, the more you can prepare them to be open to learning and being, having a good process of learning is actually an important part, right? Skills, you know, whether it's in engineering or whatever, it's, uh, you know, it's fine, you know, if, as long as they have the basic understanding of what they're trying to do, I think it's good enough you know, as, as long as they, ha they have the fundamentals, right? And the third is the ability to think from first principles, you know, not spoon-fed. You know, we are not expecting students to come in with, uh, you know, we are not looking for a chat GPT, if I may, right, if I may use the newer analogy. You're not expected to have all the answers, nor are they expected to be rote learning and coming back, right? So I think, and this is not, and this cannot be fixed at the college level. It has to start at the high school level. So I think, you know, maybe I, you know, what I would request is all of you at the college level start pushing at the school levels to say what needs to change. It can't be just industry talking to schools, high schools, right? You need to be talking to the high schools as well. So that's one part. Second, one of the things we do, first thing when we bring in a new class of uh, newly hired class is run a boot camp. So whether it is a six week or 12 week, it all depends on the company. But this is the indoctrination program that happens, right? It's literally, it's called a boot camp where they are put through both soft skills and uh, functional skills and process training. In the, in the companies that I've worked for, in fact, we are doing this in my company now, we're just going to do this going forward is, you know, I, I like to bring in students as interns for, a, you know, six months, five months, depending on, depending on the college, and get them acclimatized to working in industry before they actually get a job. So the thing that I would look for is how many internships have the children done uh, before they're graduating from college? So, and it's not an internship to that they get a certificate out of it. Like, have they done any meaningful work? And it doesn't matter what it is, even if they didn't get paid during that internship, it's okay. 
as long as they have something to hang their hat on saying, here's what I achieved during that internship. I think that's very critical. So those would be the few things that I would say. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Ram has said uh, most of it. Um, I also want to um, suggest that, uh, you know, at the stage where they are about to graduate, um, how can you increase the engagement with industry, you know, as academia or, uh, you know, institutions? How can you, what can you do more? I think think about it. We, um, uh, as from an industry standpoint, are very keen to engage early on. And particularly, I'll be a bit, uh, you know, greedy here, but we want to bring more women, more girls into STEM. We want to, you know, see them rise through the ranks. We would like to demystify some myths about certain sectors, you know, certain types of jobs, certain types of industries. How can we have a deeper engagement, you know, between industry and academia? I think even before they reach that stage, uh, maybe from, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th standard, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th standard onwards. And also um, skills, in terms of skills, yes, skills can generally be acquired, but one of my observations is um, some people are extremely brilliant technically, but they do need some support from a communication skills standpoint. And this could be uh, particularly depending upon, you know, which part of the, you know, country or state they are coming from. So what can be done to enhance their communication skills, particularly I'm saying sp spoken English. Uh, because that will give them a, a significant edge, you know, when they're sort of competing in an environment. So these are two things. And when you talk about future skilling, uh, again, yeah, we have to go back to the same thing. It's about uh, willingness to learn. Um, learnability is going to be important because what they're learning today is not going to be, you know, relevant five years down the line. So it's going to be consciously changing. So we have to instill, inculcate that, you know, trait of learnability and, you know, curiosity to keep asking questions, to keep learning more. I think uh, we are out of time, but before I let you go, um, my last 30 second answer from each of you. What have been, what is the one big challenge that you've seen in the whole evolving future of work? Geeta, maybe we start with you. Sure, thanks, Angita. Uh, one big challenge is really, you know, developing the talent for the future, which is really about upskilling and then continuous learning. Uh, to make sure that there is, like you mentioned earlier on, there has to be a lot of self-driven learning also. So organizations can definitely provide a lot of support, but there has to be that self-learning, you know, m motivation to keep learning. And I think that is a big challenge we face today when we talk about this big opportunity we have, whether it's Gen AI or anything that's going to come up soon. So that is a big thing. And added to that, I must say that there's also sometimes passive resistance to embracing new technology, em you know, resistance to change. So basically not willing to change your old ways of working, or old ways of doing things. So these are the two things we are right now grappling with. Ram? Yeah, um, I think for me, I think encouraging people to engage with each other in person, right? And that doesn't mean come to work every day, that's not what I'm referring to. I think we are, human beings are home, from homo sapiens, you know, we are tribals, right? We like to get together, we work together, we, we fight together, we argue together. And the, some of that, I think, I would, is also healthy. And what I would, uh, I think the biggest challenge that I see is uh, people withdrawing and not necessarily engaging. You know, even when they're within a group, whether they're, you know, buried there in their, in their electronic devices or whatever, how do we encourage people to talk to each other? I think talking and dialoguing is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome over the next, you know, decade as we look ahead. Thank I think you. we learn to live in our virtual hybrid world, so. Uh, not really interact. So thank you so much. Uh, I think we've had a very, very engaging conversation. Uh, I think the speakers are around and we'd love to, you know, anybody who wants to chat up further, we are available. Thank you so much. For more content on tech and leadership, subscribe to NASCOM YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.